Okay, we have chapter 11, the book of Revelation, chapter 11. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told. Now remember, we said in the last chapter, we were told in the last chapter showing that John is about to write down the things that must take place, meaning a future prophecy. And I said the, the rest of the book of Revelation are things to come. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it. Because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,250 days clothed in sackcloth. So there's two witnesses. People don't actually know who they are. It doesn't tell who, exactly who they are. Some people think it's um, a, one, a couple of the old prophets or maybe Moses or... Some people think it might be Enoch. Well, they're going to sit down here and prophesy in sackcloth for 1260 days. Then the devil is going to um, actually kill them. And it's going to be televised. It says the whole world will rejoice. So it's probably going to be televised just like you're seeing the war of um, Israel on TV right now. And so, and three days later, they they let these two um, prophets' bodies lay in the street for three days, and then they rise up. And the whole world is in complete terror and fear that they came back to life. But they sit there, they're standing there, I assume in Jerusalem, for 1260 days preaching and prophesying. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they are before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, Fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. So if you go up and try to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and kills you like a flamethrower. Like you see a flamethrower in World War II, boom. Comes right out, just devours you straight up. So apparently people are going to try to do it. And then they're going to get, um, see, the world is going to hate them. The world is trying to get rid of you, the Christian, even today. The world is trying to overpower God. The world is trying to defeat God. The world is saying, hey, listen, we'd be a lot better off without those Christians preaching that Bible. So they're going to hate these two you know, people on the earth preaching the word of God nonstop, 1260 days, dressed in sackcloth like death. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. By fire, like in hell. Because you're not harming them, actually. What you're doing is, by harming these people, you're coming up and saying, I'm against the word of God. So during this time in the tribulation, you know, most people, the, the overwhelming majority of people left on the earth after the rapture, they're basically going to be saying, 
I'm against the word of God. So, you know, when people come against you, you know, people will be your friend on earth if you buy them beer. I mean, walk in any bar and say, drinks on the house. I'm paying for all the beer. Man, everybody will love you instantly. Oh, cheers, mate. You'll be their new best friend. Then tell everybody, hey, who wants to all go out to dinner? I'm paying for it. Oh, man, they'll love you 10 times more. Now, that's a nice guy. He got us drunk and took us to dinner. <laughs> Walk into a bar and with your Bible and say, would anyone like to um, hear the word of God right now? They'll look at you like, hey, idiot, do you know where you're at? You're in a bar. You're in a biker club. We don't want to hear that um, stuff. Get it out of here. They will hate you if you preach the word of God. They will love you if you do what they're doing. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. Okay, so that's just like um, the prophet who told Israel, it will not rain for three and a half years until I say so. It will not rain. You see, the prophet went to the one widow, like a Gentile widow out in the middle of nowhere. There were plenty of Jewish widows who needed help, but God sent him away from the Jews, and the rain stopped for three and a half years, just like here. The rain's going to stop. They, did, they had power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during that time. They are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Wow. That's why they're going to be hated so much, the word of God. And, and as often as they want, they can strike plagues on the earth and turn the water into blood as often as they want to. Now, that makes you wonder, when they get done prophesying, are they going to like strike their staff on the ground like Moses did? It said they have the power to strike the earth. Well, they're not going to strike it with their hand. So they're going to strike it. Or... Yeah, and to strike the earth with every kind of plague. So maybe it doesn't mean actually strike the earth. Maybe it just means the earth is stricken with. See, I'm an outdoor guy. I got a walking stick, so I use every opportunity I can to talk about my walking stick. <laughs> that That's a true outdoor guy. Hey, have you seen my walking stick? <laughs> okay. You, you, you outdoor wilderness guys, you'll understand. Especially when I made the stick myself from scratch. Now, when they have finished their testimony, well, let me go back. So how often are they going to hit the earth with all this stuff? How often is it going to happen? Once a day, probably not. I think it'll be more along the lines of every time they prophesy a certain message, I think they're going to... They're going to be like um, tape recorders. You hit rewind and they just repeat the message. Rewind, they repeat the message. Because there really is only one message. So I think every time they give, they're done preaching a message, they'll give people a chance to repent. And then when they don't repent, they'll turn the water to blood and strike the earth with plagues. You know, kind of making it just, J-U-S-T, justice, that the people are actually given the chance, but the people hate them. They turn against the word of God, even though they could prevent it by, they could prevent it by um, turning to God. They refuse to turn 
and so be healed. I don't know, just an observation. Their bodies will be in the public square. Okay. Now, when all is finished in their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will strike them and overpower them and kill them. So the beast coming out of the abyss is going to strike them and kill them. Like I said, they're going to be killed. Their bodies will be in the public square of the great city. That's Jerusalem. It will be lie, their bodies will lie there. They, nobody will touch them. Which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. So this great city is really like Sodom and Egypt. I would never live in a city called Sodom. Not after Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible. No. I never. If I came to a city that said Sodom on it, I think I'd turn around and go the other direction. Which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, which also their Lord was crucified. So this is, you know, Jerusalem, where the Lord was crucified, Jesus. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. Now, what I'm going to read next, I want you to understand just how much you are hated as a Christian. You think, oh, well, I don't know. I get along pretty well with most of my friends. They know I'm a Christian. Well, check this out. They're going to refuse them, Beryl, but it says some people from every tribe and nation will go past their bodies and look at them. Now, look what they're going to do to these people, these dead people. And remember, God is watching for three and a half days. God is watching for three and a half days on how they treat his prophets. Now you notice how um, everything is three and a half. The tribulation is three and a half times two, seven years. 360 days, you know, three and a half years or three years. So they, they spent all this time prophesying. And the world has hated them. Now the beast rises up and it kills them. Now listen to what it says. It's given the power to kill them. So what I'm saying is given the power to kill them. Meaning, none of this stuff is happening without God allowing it. I don't believe God is approving this. God is liking it. This isn't from God. Just like people say today, why does God allow evil? Oh, why does God allow evil? Well, a better question is, why do men allow evil? God is not evil. God is not um, promoting evil. God allows evil because of your free will. So, but men, we, we not only allow evil, we promote it and we waller in it like an orgy. God doesn't do any of those things. So when I hear these guys say, why does God allow evil? Um, you are a hundred times more evil than God. You should be <laughs> asking yourself, why do I allow, why do you flourish and enjoy evil? Okay, so check this out. That's what I mean. They're, they have to be given the power. The beast rises up out of the sea. Okay. will gaze upon their bodies and refuse them burrow. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate 
by sending each other gifts. Now, this is the worst of the government can possibly be. This is the worst of the worst. You know, all the officials, I don't know, it's going to be kind of like um, Egypt when Jesus was down there. And they were celebrating when Jesus was crucified. The Jews thought, oh boy, we we got rid of our enemy. We did a great thing for God. We got rid of that false prophet, Jesus Christ. Okay, now just a pitch of the scene. You're in the great city. There's all these well-dressed, very wealthy men there and women and Jezebels and prostitutes and people on drugs and but they're all like the rich of the rich, right? And these men are they see the beasts go over and kill these two men. And the men lay there. I mean it's really so, like something out of a Hollywood movie. They're laying there on the ground. And what does the world do? The world starts gloating over them. You know what gloating is like? They, they don't allow this in sports anymore. Where like a football player will jump on top of you after he tackles you over you and start pointing at you and calling, calling you names that you're a loser. And I'm a winner. You're a loser. I'm a winner. I just kicked your blah, blah, blah. The world is going to be so happy, it's going to completely gloat over these two men lying on the streets. This is how much they hate Christianity, but the Word of God. Okay. And now check what they do next. I mean, they're gloating the first day. It's the first day. So then, you know, nighttime comes and people start partying. The whole world starts partying. The men are dead. The men are dead. The men are dead. I mean, can you imagine a world having a worldwide party that they just killed the word of God? These men have been sending plagues on the earth, turning the blood red, killing people with fire in their mouth. The whole world hated them so much. Now the party starts because nighttime comes. The drinking, you know, the orgies, the sex, the drugs. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts. When's the last time you've been to a funeral and all the people are clapping and rejoicing and dancing and gloating over the dead body and they start sending each other gifts and rejoicing that the person up there is dead because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth they're going to send each other gifts can you imagine today getting a gift in the mail hey my my mother died, and she was an old, um, you know, hag, an old sea hag. And we are so happy that she's dead. We're sending everybody we know a gift to celebrate her dying. Now she can never torment us anymore. She can never make us take out the garbage. I mean, can you imagine such a thing happening in today's society? So the reason I'm um saying talking about this a lot is because I'm trying to give you a picture of just how evil the earth is and how wrecked the earth is and how all these things are happening on the earth. The whole world starts sending each other gifts to celebrate the death of these two prophets. Now, you got to wait for the rest of the story because, like I said, God is watching. God is watching. But then 
God shows up. Then what happens? What happens when God shows up? What happens when God says, hey, I'm here. Well, people that don't follow God are in complete terror and fear, scared to death. Okay, now watch this. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. God breathes down the breath of life into them from above. Can you imagine sitting there partying and you're gloating? Hey, let's go look at the dead bodies again. And you're drunk and you got a bottle of wine. And you're going over there and you're rich and powerful. And you think we've defeated our enemy. We defeated our enemy. And the breath comes out of the sky down into them. Can you imagine the sheer terror People were under. God, the breath from the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet. They immediately stood right up, like they never died at all. And terror struck those who saw them. Like I said, it's probably going to be televised on the internet. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them. So now God's going to speak. Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while they their enemies looked on. So God gave them life again. And they were alive. They stood up and then he raptured them. In a sense, well, it didn't say he brought them up there dead. No, it's it's more like they went up in the clouds, like we're going to go get caught up with the Lord in the clouds. When the Lord left the disciples, he went up into the clouds. So these two prophets went up into the clouds like a rapture, like their own little miniature rapture. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. So you got this great city, and 10% of the entire city just collapsed upon itself. Kind of like, kind of like what you're seeing on TV today with the war in Israel going against, um, you know, their enemies, the Palestines. I mean, Israel's going in and just knocking down at least 10% of all the buildings and everything. God's going to do this in five minutes with a great earthquake. So your enemies stand up, they go up into the clouds, and then an earthquake starts, and you know, you know, you're on the earth, you know God is speaking, God is coming against you. God is telling you to repent, get on your knees, repent, get on your knees, repent. They will not repent. They refuse to repent. So, okay, so then we're almost at the seventh trumpet. Remember I said, what is the seventh trumpet? We haven't got to it yet. A tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in an earthquake in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming. That's the seventh trumpet. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there was there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of the Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. So, okay. 
the seventh angel surround or sounded his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on the throne before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who was, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. So you see, the Lord, this must be right towards the end of the tribulation. The Lord is going to get ready to bring heaven down to earth for 1,000 years during the 1,000-year reign of Christ. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets. You see, this is a time you're getting ready to be rewarded because you follow Jesus Christ. All I can say is you can't follow Jesus enough on this earth. You can't follow him enough. You cannot follow Jesus enough. You will be greatly rewarded and made into a wealthy, you know, perfect spiritual being for all eternity. You cannot follow Jesus enough. I want to show you something here. I'll finish up by letting you look at look at that fog. Just go through the trees there. You think about the glory of God. You know, the power of Jesus Christ, the glory of God. Just look at the fog just gently rolling across the top of those trees. Now, if you were in there, you would see, you know, the, the raindrops, the dew being caught on the branches and, you know, the twigs of the tree and falling and running down the tree, falling to the ground, watering the ground. To me, these are the things I like about God. It's just watching this; these things happen right in front of my eyes. And right behind me is a highway. People go, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour all day. They don't ever stop it. Or they look sideways out the window. You never really... You know, men who used to be men and women, you know, they wouldn't just look at it. They would go over to, they'd say, hey, that's a good spot for a cabin. They'd go over there with an axe and build a cabin in three butts. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come for the judging of the dead and for Rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people judging the dead. Does that mean the rapture has not happened? No. Listen to what it says. The time has come to judge the dead and reward your servants. Okay, that's the, um, the judgment day. He's calling them dead because they are going to end up in hell for all eternity. They're going to hell for all eternity. So you're as good as dead, but you won't be dead. And for rewarding the prophets, well, for those of you who follow Jesus, you're gonna you're called a priest, you're called a prophet, you're called a saint. You're called all these incredible things by God. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servant, the prophet. And your people who reserve, who revere, R-E-V-E-R-E, -E -E, who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. 
Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant. There you go. The temple of God is open, and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, per pearls, peals of thunder. It's peals, P-E-A-L-S, peals of thunder. An earthquake and severe hailstorm. That is the end of chapter 11. Oh, yeah. These all get very fascinating and profound from here on out. But I want to um, point out this one thing. There's something that should be of importance to me and you, both great and small. The people listening to this Bible study are not great. You are not a, considered a great person on this earth, and neither am I. Oh, no. I'm not a great person. We are and small. We are the small people. And I'm proud of that. I got no apologies for that. I'm a small person. I got a small operation. I'm a small-time guy. That is exactly how I want it. Be a small time guy. You should take pride. The Bible says you in your lowly position to take pride in your high position. What does that mean? That means you who are low and small and humble in the Lord. You should take pride in your high position because the Lord has high regard for your situation, your position. And the Lord lifts up the humble and the small. He lifts you up. So I wanted to point that out. You know, you're out there, you think, oh, what can I, um, I'm such a small time guy. What can I do here? You don't have to do anything, my friends. Nothing. Jesus is going to do all of it for you. Now, I'm not saying you have to pray, you have to read your Bible, you have to take care of your family, you have to um, go to church probably and find a good pastor. But, you know, the pastor said this morning, the number one pe problem people have in his church is they come to um, church on Sunday, drink four gallons of milk, in six days a week, they starve to death because they don't. He was talking about reading the Bible. Six days a week, people don't read the Bible. Then they just listen to their pastor read the Bible for a couple hours. And they expect to survive all week. No, you're supposed to be reading the Bible every day. 